Okay. Okay. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy for revealing us your great glory and giving us your divine blessings. We thank you, dear Lord, for gathering us always in your home where we find refuge. I thank you, dear Lord, for your amazing words and your amazing gifts that you've given us. Help us, O oh Lord, to embrace the spirit of prayer, not for the sake of praying, but for the sake of drawing close to you. I pray, dear Lord, that you would speak to us and that you would work in our hearts. I pray, dear Lord, that the work that you begin today, you would complete it until that final day. I ask all this in your precious name, through the intercession of St. Mary and the witnesses of the Holy Transfiguration, hear us when we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I have a confession. I feel kind of lonely up here because you guys are so far. And I have to stand back here because of the camera. So there are seats up here if you want to. Um, there's lots of room. I don't want anyone to have to stand unless you're a stander and you just like to stand, but there's lots of room. All right. So we're considering, we're continuing our series on the treasures of orthodoxy. Now, I'm surprised that anyone showed up to the talk because I warned you what it was going to be about and you still came. Maybe those of you who have insomnia thought maybe this will help you, and uh, I'm really glad you came anyway. It really is one of the best tools we have in the Orthodox Church, and I mean that personally. I think a lot of people have had unpleasant experiences with the Igbeya, and that doesn't mean that it's not valuable. And so that's kind of what I wanted to discuss, and... I understand that anything you do in the spiritual life can be done without spirit. It can seem boring. The liturgy, the Bible, anything you do can be like that. You can't say, well, the Bible, I read it one time, it was boring, so I'm going to stop reading it. Or I'm going to stop going to church because it was boring. Maybe there's a better way to benefit from it. And so that's kind of what I'm hoping to do. I'll be honest. I discovered the Igbeya. For those who are not familiar with the Igbeya, the Igbeya is the Book of Hours. Agb is ours. So it is a prayer book that we've been given through the church for centuries, handed down to us. It has the seven main hours of the day that we pray in, and I'll get into that later. But that's kind of what we're talking about, the prayer book that we've been given from the early centuries. My prayer life changed when I was 17 when I discovered the Igbeya, and it was never the same. And there are times where I retreat from the Igbeya. My prayer life is very weak. And when I have the Igbeya in it, my life is expanded. If you look at your own prayers, if you were to take out the prayers for your spouses and your children and everyone you know who's sick, what's left? Sometimes we're adding like our neighborhood pets just so that we could like stand there and say we prayed longer. But our prayers oftentimes are routine. We pray for the same things every day oftentimes. And oftentimes our individual prayers are not getting us closer to God. We just say them because we know we're supposed to say them. Usually they're very needy prayers where we're just asking God, how often in your prayers is there a time of just adoration? How often in your prayers is there a spirit of repentance? What are the titles that you use for God when you pray? Dear Lord, our Father, Jesus. That's it. There might be a few more in there, but when you use the Igbeya, what are some of the titles we give him? Beneficent 
and merciful God. What does beneficent mean? Does anyone know what beneficent means? The word benefit comes from the word beneficent. The one who disperses benefits. So, oh, we thank you, O oh one who disperses benefits and the merciful one. We call him the lover of mankind. We call him the Pantocrator. And when we call him those things, like when we say, and we ask and entreat your goodness, O oh lover of mankind. Like when you think you're talking to the lover of mankind and you're entreating his goodness. Oftentimes we're talking about his mercy. When we're talking about the things that he's done for us, we're calling him the Pantocrator, the Almighty, the one who is in charge of all the universe. Those names have a meaning and a purpose in their prayers. And when you pray them with understanding, it changes your posture in your prayer. And so I just want us to realize that the Agbeya can transform your connection with God. I remember meeting Ambassador Bamon, who's different than Ambassador Abian, very similar names, but he was the head of a monastery, and one of his monks says, I don't want to use the Agbeya, so he said, fine, go ahead, try and pray without the Agbeya. After two days, the monk came running back, please give me my Agbeya back, because he was being fought because he didn't have enough to pray about. So before we actually get to the Igbeya, and I apologize, I was going to do the introduction last week and the Igbeya, like really Igbeya this week, I got to discuss some of the guides on prayer. Because if you don't go into the prayer properly, you don't have the proper understanding, the actual experience is not beneficial. So one of my favorite fathers is St. Theophan the Recluse. He kind of gathered the Philokalia. He's read all the old fathers. He kind of brought it to us. He wrote four homilies on prayer. You can just write this name, St. Theophan the Recluse, four homilies on prayer. It's seven pages. They were letters that he was writing to nuns on how to pray. And the first homily is about using a prayer book. And so I thought, I'm going to definitely share with you the spirit of how we should pray before we actually do it. And he says, one of the things that they used to do in the old days when they talk about prayers and monks would meet each other, they wouldn't ask, how are you feeling? How is your health? They would ask, how is your prayer? It's actually one of the most important things in our spiritual life, and we neglect it. Oftentimes, we try to do other things, but if the prayer is weak, like they consider the prayer the breath of the Spirit. So if there is no breath, there is no life. How is your prayer? We need to work on our prayer <clears throat> if that's what makes the soul live. He says, not every act of prayer is prayer. And I want you to understand, sometimes you can go into your room, you can stand in front of the icons, that's not yet prayer. He says, that's the equipment of prayer. And even if you recite the prayers or you hear them from a book, or you hear someone else reading them, he says that's not yet prayer. That's a tool or a method to pray. And this is, um, I want you to really pay attention to this quote. Forgive me for the color theme. I totally messed it up on the PowerPoint. He says, not every act of prayer is prayer. But he says, prayer itself is the piercing of our hearts by pious feelings towards God, one after another. These are the Feelings you should have in your prayer. Feelings of humility, submission, gratitude, doxology. Do you know what doxology is? Dox is like glory. So it's glor uh, correct glory, correct praise. So it's praising God, forgiveness, heartfelt prostration. Do you know what a prostration is? It's a matanya when we bow. It's a heartfelt bowing. Brokenness, conformity to the will of God. These are some of the range of feelings we should have when we pray. And I want you to just examine your prayers without the Igbeya and ask, how often are you having the feelings of submission and conformity to the will of God and brokenness on your own? Oftentimes, it might be missing. He says, like, it's feelings one after another. He says, our effort should be directed so that during our prayers, these feelings and feelings like them should fill our souls.
In another place, someone talks about it, it might be St. Theophan. He says there's three levels of prayer. And I think oftentimes our experience in the Igbeya, we've been stuck at the first level. The first level is the prayer of the mouth. Oftentimes when you have the Igbeya and you're reading it, and oftentimes when we're standing together, we're reading it together, we're just using our mouths, not our minds and not our hearts. I've been to a youth meeting. I was asked to speak at a youth meeting, and they prayed the Igbeya right before the meeting. Then they said, Mark, come speak. I said, okay, I just have one question. Does anyone know any of the Psalms that you just read? They're like, what do you mean? I was like, you prayed a prayer right now, and you had no idea what you just prayed. Does anyone have any verse that you... I was like, they did it simply from their mouth. It was a synchronized reading exercise, which I think many of us kind of got dissuaded from because maybe that was our experience growing up. Oftentimes in our own personal prayers, it's the prayer of the mouth as well. We just, thank you, Lord. We're just saying, thank you, Lord. Uh, please take care of this. The things that we just got used to saying. It says the next level of praying is praying of the mind. It's one thing to read the words and just say them. It's one thing to understand every word. And he says, you have to actually understand every single word that you say. Praying with understanding is critical. And if you're just saying words, it's not yet prayer. Because you're not going to have any of those feelings if all you're doing is saying big words. But he says, the next part, you're saying them, you're understanding them. The third part is prayer of the heart, that you're feeling them. And he says this. Understand, in yellow it says, understand what you are reading and feel what you are understanding. He says, no other rules are necessary. Pray with understanding Pray with feeling. For people who say, don't be carried away by emotions, I don't think God wants robots. If you read the Psalms, there's emotion in every single one of them. And if you're supposed to make them your own, how could you have the feeling of humility and prostration and forgiveness without emotion? They're there. You are supposed to have feelings. Don't rely on the feelings. Don't be upset if there aren't feelings. But it is kind of strange to never have any feelings in prayer. And people say, oh, that's just not the way we pray. I was like, yes, it is. That is exactly how we're, he's like, two rules. Understand what you say and mean it. Every word. He's kind of strict in his prayer, which I'm glad. He says, I'm going to give you three instructions. Always begin prayer with at least a little preparation. Number two, do not pray carelessly, but with attention and feeling. Number three, do not go on to ordinary work immediately after prayer. Begin your prayer with at least a little preparation. For those who pray at night, sometimes it's after watching TV, and your mind is filled with something else, then you go and pray. Your body, your mind is not in the spirit of prayer, so your words are very cold. If you just went to the gym, or this is probably the situation where you really need to prepare, you've tried to gather your kids to pray. There might have been a little bit of shouting, yelling, not cursing, spanking. There might be very increased rapid heart rate, and then you're going to go pray. Actually, that's the time where you calm yourself before you pray. And this is probably one of the most important parts of beginning your prayer. If you don't begin right, if you don't have the right posture when you enter, then you may not get anything out of it. So if you were to open your Igbeya, page one, we say, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The next thing you say is, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, Lord bless us, amen. How do we usually say it? Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, Lord bless us, amen. That doesn't work. But if you say it slowly, it actually calms your mind and your spirit and your body. If you say it like this, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, 
Lord, have mercy. Lord, bless us. Amen. When you say it that slow, <clears throat> you're slowing down your breathing, but you're beginning to understand who you are. The Igbeya put that there. Why is the first thing that we say, Kyrieleison, Kyrieleison? Why is the first thing we're saying is, have mercy on me? Why is the first thing that? Because who are we standing in front of? We're in standing in front of the Almighty God who rules the universe. A lot of times we say, hey God, you know, no. What do we do? I don't deserve this privilege. Have mercy on me, accept me, allow me to be here before you now. It's a way of humbling yourself realizing your unworthiness so that when you begin the very next word, what is the very next word we say? Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. When you've started off with humility, then the glory means more, especially when you see how little you are and how great He is. And if you were to just take your time in just those two sentences, your whole prayer begins off with the right spirit. Start off with slowing. So phones, if you're one of 18 WhatsApp groups, put your phone on silent while you're praying because everyone is going to like, you know, send some type of text. You're going to be distracted. Prepare. The things that are bothering you in your mind and you need to pray like you're frazzled, lift them up to God first before you begin your prayer. Don't let them just distract you and take away your prayer. <clears throat> Sometimes you might just need to stand for a moment in the beginning of your prayer, take a quick walk, do whatever. There was one monk who before he would go into his cell, <clears throat> he would always walk like several laps around his cell. The other monk was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm leaving my thoughts outside because when I go into my cell, I want to pray. Many of us, we take all of our craziness inside and then we can't think one moment towards God we're just being attacked by all these thoughts that preparation go into your prayer slowly humbly and start with adoration you're then set for the rest of the prayer so that's the preparation part he says do not pray carelessly but with attention and feeling he says it's important, I already talked about that every word that you say you have to understand, but he says, if you pray a word carelessly, like if you're just reading a psalm and you just read it and you have no idea what you read, he says, go back and read it. Then go back and read it. Then go back and read it until you've run, read it correctly. This is how you fight the thoughts. You keep doing it so that your mind is actually, when I'm trying to just pray on my own without the prayer book, I have a lot more opportunities for thoughts to flood my mind. But when I'm focusing on words, my mind is simple. I can't do two things. So I'm reading, focusing on that, and now all of a sudden my prayer is focused. So it's very important. He says, I want everyone to keep a prayer rule according to the blessing of your spiritual father. Anyone hear about that before? I've been speaking about it every single week for the last I don't know how many weeks. A prayer rule, and this is why people sometimes are afraid of the Igbeya, because we were told to pray the Igbeya, and you're like, okay, there's the introduction, there's 12 Psalms, there's the gospel, there's a litany. I was like, I can't. What is the prayer rule? It's when your spiritual guide says, I want you to read this much a day, and that's it. Don't do more, don't do less. What is the purpose of that? The purpose is so that it gets you into the prayer, and that you are doing something every day. And he says, not more than you can read unhurried, unhurriedly in a normal day. Meaning, don't say, oh my gosh, I've got this much prayer, I'm going to just read it all fast. Because then what are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> You're doing nothing. It's better to pray a little with attention and feeling than to feel like i got to pray all this and get through it. Don't do that. And so even our fathers here at this church are saying, start off with the Thanksgiving prayer. And that's it, like maybe just the Thanksgiving prayer. Just get used to praying the Thanksgiving prayer where you can pray it with your attention and feeling. 
The other thing he says, it's actually good to become familiar with the prayers before you actually get to them. So like in your free time, just kind of look at him. He says, that way you know what the feeling is when you get to that point. He says, it's better the more you are aware of what you're doing, the better you'll do it. Then he says, you know, like, make sure you read everything carefully and you understand every word. And then he talks about something, and I'm going to call it a pause point. And this is where the Egbeya becomes beautiful. Call it a pause point or a launch point. It's the same thing. That there will be times when you're praying, and if you're praying carefully and you're reading the words and understanding them, they're actually spiritual words. And then something will hit you, and you're like, this is nice. I'm going to pause. I'm just going to sit and reflect on this thing that I just read. I'm not going to just race to the rest of the psalm. I'm just going to pause. Sometimes the Spirit is trying to speak to you on that specific sentence and just go with it. He says this is where you end up having the feelings for God. I'm going to give you a couple. After the Our Father prayer, we pray the Thanksgiving prayer. There's a point where you should always pause where we say, I thank you for everything, concerning everything, and at all times. You're saying, I thank you for everything, at all times, no matter what. And granted, you want to say, thank you for covering me, helping me, guarding me, which are amazing things, and I could talk about those. But then you want to have the spirit of gratitude in your prayer. So don't just say, I thank you for everything, concerning everything, everything you've covered us, help. No, stop. Stop and then begin to thank him for everything. And all of a sudden, this could take you a long time. But it's okay, because then what have you done? You've then honestly, consciously thought of the things that God has given you. How do you feel that God is amazing? That I am so blessed. I have been given more than I deserve. You have the spirit of gratitude so that when you're saying all the praises, they really are from your heart. You need to have pause points. In Psalm 50, the next prayer, he says, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. What should you do? Acknowledge your transgressions. That is your time for counting or recounting all your sins and feeling sorry for them. So that when you're praying the prayer, have mercy upon me and blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquities, tell him which ones you want to have removed. Another pause point, and there's a lot of them. Create in me a clean heart, O God. I always pause there. Pause that one and pray for a clean heart, a pure heart, a heart that doesn't do this sin. God, give me a heart that doesn't do that. Like, whatever heart you need, say, God, create in me that heart. Just pause and let God give you whatever he gives you. And you will find that in the Egbeya, you will discover a new verse. I know it may not sound like a big deal, but this week, God's one of the verses in the Thanksgiving prayer, which I prayed a thousand times, um, and those things which are profitable, good and profitable, do provide for us. And you're like, okay. That really spoke to me. Like, I'm not asking for the things that I want. I'm saying, God, the things that you see good and profitable. I'm not asking for God for bad things. I'm not asking God for specific things. I'm asking God whatever. You, so then it's a matter of me saying, I'm going to stop looking for things, whatever you give me. I'm going to accept. I know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. So whatever you see good and profitable, provide for us. That's the only request in the Thanksgiving prayer that's, I mean, he does say, you know, let us pass it in peace. And another prayer, which I don't think we pray for our kids. I know we all want our kids to be safe and everything. All envy, all temptation, all all the work of Satan, the counsel of wicked men, the rising up of enemies, hidden and manifest, take them away from us and from all your people. Do you guys pray like that for your kids? Why not? We have no reason not to. So it's such a complete prayer. 
So, the beauty of the Psalms is every emotion is in there. Every emotion that you're feeling. If you are confused, if you are angry, if you are sad, if you are lonely, depressed, joyful, it's in there. I'm going to look at Psalm 12 real quick. Okay, I'm just going to read it from here. But if you have your Bea, you can go ahead. It's in the first hour. But tell me, if you have had these feelings, but you never expressed them to God the way you wanted to, it's the how long, O Lord, how long will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will, like you're like, God, how long? I'm suffering. How long? Where are you? David said it. You know what? It was okay. And you want to know what's amazing about this psalm? He seems upset. He's like, God, have you left me? Like, I'm totally defeated. Look at the last two verses. But I've trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. He took the emotion that you're feeling and then he kind of sanctified it and like, okay, I just need to be patient. You've always done good things for me, and I know you always will. Every emotion that you have is in the Psalms. So when you pray them, you will find the words that you wanted to say, you'll find them in the Psalms. Okay, I'm going to kind of get toward the end here, but this is how you taste the sweetness of the prayers. He says, the skill of praying with piety, attention, and feeling according to a prayer book itself leads to the higher levels of prayer. I'm going to give you a little bit of history about the Agbeya, just like one line, uh, a quick story. So it was given to us, the seven hours of prayer was given to us in the very early church. St. Mark gave us like, you know, in the Bible, in like, in Acts it'll say, and they went to the temple to pray in the third hour. It says they went to the temple daily. They were going at the hours of prayer. So there was a dispute where like, how much adoration should we do? How many psalms should we do? They'd gather in the temple. They were having the dis dispute, and while they gathered to pray, guess what happened? An angel came and recited 11 psalms, and then sang some praises, and then finished with a psalm. They're like, let's put 12 psalms in every hour. And so in every hour, except for the first hour, which has like 18 they all have 12 psalms. They're like, wow. Like this was given, like God kind of confirmed this was a good number by an angel. I'll take it. Like to me, that's good. This was given to us through the centuries, confirmed by the angel. These are the words of God and the saints given back to us. We're praying, what are we praying? We're actually praying a gospel. We're praying like the psalms. We're praying the Bible. We're actually saying the Bible out loud and you're praying it with your heart. You're not reading it. And so this is sometimes the difference between reading the Bible and praying the Bible. It's actually in the Agabea, you could be reading it, meditating on it, praying it, and figuring out how to plan it. Sometimes you can just read the Bible and just read the Bible. Same thing with the Agabea. It's actually, you might read more in the Bible in one day in the Agabea than you might actually read in the Bible on your own. So just real quickly, the structure of the Igbeya for those who are not familiar with it. There's the introduction, the sign of the cross, the Kyrie eleison, and the glory be. Always start with those, whatever hour it is. Then there's the Our Father prayer. When you pray alone, do you ever just pr pray, My Father who art in heaven? It's always Our Father? Always? Wait a minute, who are you calling? as if everyone is your brother and sister. So like there's a priest who would take 15 minutes to pray the Our Father prayer. Because if you think about every line, our Father, not our Lord, our friend, our Father. What did Christ say when you go into your inner closet and call to him our Father? And he says over and over in that passage, he's your Father. How often do you talk to God as a Father? We talk to him as like a God who's far away, big, like, 
So the Our Father prayer comes next. Thanksgiving prayer gives you the spirit of gratitude. Psalm 50 gives you the spirit of humility and asking for repentance. If you never get beyond those, it's fine. There are many times where I'm praying those prayers and I feel like I connected with God in just this part that I don't need to go on. Sometimes God will just take you and you don't, you're like, okay, I only have 10 minutes or 15 minutes. You only gave yourself an hour and you didn't get past Psalm 50. It happens. Then in the first hour, there are the matanyas. We worship you and ask you, entreat you, O Christ our God. We ask and entreat you, O Christ our Savior. We ask and entreat you, O Christ our King. Like, what do you do during those? You actually bow. You know what a matanya is? Where you kneel down, you put your head to the floor. You're adoring God. And then there's a part in the first hour where it's Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. Why is that in the first hour? You know, have an idea why this one is in the first hour, in the first thing you pray? I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with patience, forbearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You are one body and one Spirit. In the morning, he's saying, love everybody. You get your heart reset. If you've been angry at someone, you pray that prayer. You go back and you just love the next person you see. Your heart is corrected in it. You start your day perfect. That's why it's there. So everything is there for a reason. It's wonderful. One of the things that you may not realize in the Igbeya one of the, and this I'll probably end with this. One of the biggest emphasis in the Igbeya is to not sin. It's actually to not sin. The focus is being holy. We say, um, the night is gone, we give thanks to you and ask that you keep us and save us this day without sin. Like right after you did the three matanyas, keep us this day without sin. In the Psalm 50, you're talking about all the sins you want to get rid of. We say, after we do the 41 Kirilasons, holy, 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 and forgive us our sins, knowingly and unknowingly, secretly and openly, hidden man. Like you're saying, God, get rid of every single sin I've done. I don't, the things I know about, know, like I just want to be holy. If you look for that theme, I don't know how often your own prayers are, I just want to be holy and be rid of sin. This is where it is. So you have your introduction, you have your Psalm 4, or your Ephesians 4, you have 12 Psalms, you don't have to pray them all. One priest told me, just pray three different ones a day. Um, you'll have your favorite ones, you're going to love them. You have the Gospel, the Litanies, the 41 Kyrielesons, the Absolution, and the Conclusion. We'll go over it more, but I think if you were to start off with the Thanksgiving prayer and the Conclusion... The conclusion is actually one of the most complete prayers. Like all the things that you're like, wow, ease our life. Guide us to carry out your commandments. Sanctify our souls. Cleanse our bodies. Conduct our minds. Purify our intentions. Heal our diseases. Forgive us our sins. Deliver us from every destructive grief and distress of heart. I mean, I know you guys are good prayer warriors. But does anyone have a prayer like that? Pray that Every day, like every day. Let your kids, it's an easy one for them to learn. Let's stand up and pray that one. So we're going to stand up and pray. Sorry it took long, but I actually was going to try to do the Agbeya in like only 18 talks and try to put it in one. Um, and you got like a bit of a summary. So let's stand up and pray. And we are going to... We're going to conclude with this prayer. And then I'll say a small prayer at the end. Name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. All together. Have mercy on us, O God, and have mercy on us, who at all times and in every hour in heaven and on earth is worshipped and glorified. Christ our God, the good, the long-suffering, the abundant in mercy, and the great in compassion, who loves the righteous, and has mercy on the sinners of whom I am chief, who does not wish the death of the sinner, but rather that he returns and lives, 
who calls all the salvation for the promise of the good things to come. Lord, receive from us our prayers in this hour and in every hour. Ease our life. Guide us to fulfill your commandments. Sanctify our spirits. Cleanse our bodies. Conduct our thoughts. Purify our intentions. Heal our diseases. Forgive our sins. Deliver us from every evil grief and distress of heart. Surround us by your holy angels, that by their camp we may be guarded and guided and attain the unity of faith, knowledge of your imperceptible and infinite glory, for you are blessed forever. Amen. I thank you, dear Lord, for you have instructed us on how to pray, on how to connect with you. Dear Lord, I pray that you would draw close to each and every one of us in our prayers. Help us, O Lord, to develop that bond, dear Lord, where the times of prayer are times that we feel like we can't do without, that those are our precious moments in every day. Help us, O Lord, to just waste time with you. Help us, O Lord, not to be distracted by all the things that are trying to take us away from the prayer, but let us relish in your glory, in your blessings, in your mercy, in your great loving kindness. I pray that this would be an amazing house of prayer and each of our homes would be amazing houses of prayer and each of our lives would be amazing lives and temples of prayer. We ask all this through the intercession of St. Mary and all the beloved saints who have gone before us. Hear us when we, your children, say to you with all our hearts, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I hope everyone has an Igbeya. We'll get an Igbeya. It's on the app, Coptic Reader. Just begin slowly. You don't have to do the whole hour, but just begin. Let's talk about it in three weeks when I come back. <laughs>